Okay, hello everyone, hello everybody. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, today, Professor Bori will start a new cycle of lectures, and this lecture will go throughout uh, for three months. That is October, November, and uh, September, from September 12th, let's say from September 12th to December 10 or 12th, something like, like this. First of all, I would first like to present Professor Boris before he starts uh, the lecture. Boris uh, was, uh, was born in Minsk, Belarus. Belarus. He, has, uh, he has received a Master of Science in Physics from the Belarusian State University at, at Minsk in 1977 a PhD in theoretical physics from the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology in 1981, and the doctor of science degree habilitation, known, known as a habilitation in theoretical physics from the Bogolyubov Institute for Theoretical Physics at the Ukrainian Academy of Science, Kiev, in 1989. Till 1991, he was a senior researcher at the Institute of Oceanology of the Russian Academy of Science at Moscow, at Moscow. And since 1991, he was an associate professor. And since 1998, a full professor at the Tel Aviv University in Israel. Since 2015, Boris is a holder of a personal research chair Optical Soliton, funded by the Tel Aviv University in Israel. He has, he has published more than 1,200 research papers and four books. His H index is uh, 86 from, uh, from the Web of Science and about 100 from Google Scholar. He is an editor of three major international journals, Physics uh, Letter A, Carl Solito and Fratton and Frontier in Physics, and an editorial board member of Journal of Optics, Symmetry, Photonics, Science Scientific Report, Optics Communication, and CAO. Professor Boris is a senior member of the Optical Society of America, recently named to Optica. During this cycle of lecture, he will address several topics of general interest on the theory of uh, nonlinear wave pattern formation and soliton. Thus, we can, we can ask Boris to introduce his lecture and then follow up. And be, be, before this, uh, today is a special day for, for the le lectures. He was supposed to give the lecture last Tuesday, but he was not uh, available. And also, next Tuesday, he will not give a lecture. The lecture will be given by, by Professor Allen for three hours. And on, uh, he will resume the lecture on Tuesday 26, I think. Okay, we welcome you, Boris. Okay, thank you very much, Manuel, for the introduction and for the invitation to uh, give the third cycle of lectures organized by you. <clears throat> It's a very interesting uh, uh, possibility for me to try to present the material of my work to many people who may be interested in it. And um, I hope it may be useful for some people who would like to learn uh, th this material. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so as um, Professor Kendner said, it will be the cycle, if I understand correctly, of 15 lectures. And I will try to uh, to follow the schedule. Also, sometimes some interruptions in the schedule may be possible, particularly because approximately in a month from now, I will have to move to start my sabbatical at another place. I will continue to give lectures, but just for the travel, uh, maybe it will uh, it will be necessary to make some small adjustments. Okay, and in any case, let us start the material. And so um, <clears throat> the general topic of this cycle of lectures will be um, the uh, review of the modern situations, uh, state of art in theoretical and partly experimental studies 
of what people frequently call nonlinear science, in particular with emphasis <clears throat> on objects such as solitons and various nonlinear patterns. And we will try to address both the mathematical aspect of this works, the study of various equations, models, and their solutions. And in parallel, I will try to discuss the physical realizations and physical applications of these mathematical results. Uh, so, because we are going to um, discuss uh, various models of nonlinear physics, it will be quite natural uh, to select as the first topic for the first lecture what you can read now in the title. So, we will uh, try to discuss today uh, the most essential nonlinear partial differential equations in physics and also. I will try to present a brief overview of the most important fundamental solutions of these equations. So in subsequent lectures, I plan to address in more detail particular items, particular equations, particular models, and particular solutions, as well as their applications that will be uh, the subject of the overview that I will try to give in this first lecture. So maybe today we will not have enough time to complete uh, this topic. In that case, we will continue um, the next time. In any case, let us proceed. And uh, this is the structure of this first lecture. Maybe, as I said, it will be more than one lecture to uh, cover all the topics. So there will be some introduction. And th then it is followed by the list of the most important equations that I will try to consider and discuss. And these are universal equations because they find uh, applications in sometimes in very different uh, fields of physics. So the first, uh, the first type of equations that we will discuss, it is uh, two equations, which is a matter of fact, are nearly identical. They, they have different names depending on the context in which people consider these equations. So essentially, this is what may be called the nonlinear Schrodinger equations. And they also have another popular name, the Gro gross petayevsky equations, in the case when they are used as fundamental dynamical models for the description of dynamics of uh, Bose-Einstein condensates. So this will be, I will try to explain what it means still in the first lecture, a little bit later. Then the second uh, fundamentally important equations, equations that we will discuss today, it is a very famous mathematical model, and the model with very important physical realizations, which is called Kortevec de Vries or for, bre for brevity KDV equation. And then the third, item in the list of the most fundamental equations. It is another very famous model, uh, also with very important physical applications and with very remarkable mathematical solutions. It is called the sine gordon equation. Frequently, people use the uh, acronym SG for this equation. So all these uh, this first three classical equations, they all are one-dimensional equations, which means that they have two independent variables, as we will see, as the evolutional variable, typically it's time, and one coordinate. Then there are some very important equations, which are two-dimensional equations. And as examples of, of this, in this first lecture, I will introduce two equations, which essentially are known under the same name, by the name of people who were the first to introduce these equations of physics is the Kadamts of Petriashvili equations. So there are two different equations, as we will see, depending on the sign of some particular parameter. So they are called Kadamts of Petriashvili or for brevity KP equations of type one and type two. And as we will see, they have very different solutions. Uh, so um, what is common for these four equations that I have mentioned? I mean, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, the Kortebeck de Vries equation, and Sine Gordon equation 
in one dimension and also for both KP1 and KP2 equations in two dimensions. This is the fact that in their uh, uh, most fundamental forms, these equations are not only universal, but also they share a remarkable property of exact integrability. It means that there is an extremely powerful mathematical technique which makes it possible to generate a huge number of very important and highly non-trivial exact solutions to these equations. Of course, this is a very remarkable and very special, a very unusual property that you can uh, uh, try to, to work with a nonlinear partial differential equation. And suddenly you may find the possibility to produce a very large number of exact solutions to this equation. And then um, one more um, item that will be included in, the, in this first lecture. These are very different models because these first four equations are not only integrable, but also uh, they, uh, they all um, feature a more general property. They are conservative equations, which means that they can be derived from, they conserve the energy, they conserve some other dynamic invariants such as momentum, for example, and uh, uh, they can be derived accordingly from the respective Hamiltonian or Lagrangian. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, many uh, physically relevant models should take into regard effects of dissipation. Dissipation, and then if we have dissipation, it's also necessary, of course, to consider uh, some uh, effects which can compensate the dissipation. If we have only dissipation, the dissipation will eventually kill any dynamics. The situation will become trivial. So in order to compensate dissipation and support nonlinear situation, it's necessary to have uh, something which is called amplification or frequently it's called gain. In some other contexts, it may be called a pump. And this, uh, so if we consider Nonlinear dissipative models, which include both uh, dissipation, in other words, losses and gain, which must compensate the losses, it gives rise to a completely different class of models. Of course, they are not integrable, uh, they are not conservative, but they also produce very interesting mathematical solutions. And they, uh, these solutions pre actually predict very interesting physical phenomena in various relevant situations. And so this uh, a particular, a very general and important class of such nonlinear dissipative models is based on the equations which are called uh, Ginzburg-Landau equations. So Ginzburg-Landau equations, roughly speaking, we will discuss it in some detail. This, they, in, in terms of their mathematical formal structure, they are, uh, seem to be similar to the nonlinear Schrodinger equations, but the difference is that uh, some coefficients which are real in nonlinear Schrodinger equations, they naturally are replaced by complex coefficients in terms of the Ginzburg-Landau equations. So actually, this is a, one of the reasons why this class of models is called the complex Ginzburg-Landau equations. And then finally, this first lecture, maybe one, more than one lecture, the first topic will uh, be uh, uh, will include, of course, a conclusion and some general discussion before. In, next, in other lectures, we will proceed to considering more specific models and more specific solutions. Okay, so let us start from some general discussion. And the general, for the general discussion, we can look at this commonly known equation, which is the fundamental Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics. So the Schrodinger equation is written here. I assume uh, it's known to every participant uh, of this uh, event. So this is an equation which was uh, introduced by its author, by the famous Austrian theoretical physicist, Erwin Schrodinger. As if I remember correctly, he introduced this equation in, in year 1926, so almost 100, 100 years ago. And then very quickly, it became the most important equation in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So in the general case, this equation is written in the three-dimensional form. So nabla squared, this is a standard notation for the 
a linear operator, which also is called Laplacian, the combination of the uh, second derivatives with respect to coordinates x, y, and z. So we have three coordinates x, y, and z, and this is the equation for the complex wave function. So the complex wave function is the wave function of a quantum particle, and its physical meaning is very well known. If we take the squared um, absolute value of this function, it will predict the, probab the density, the probability <coughs> to find the, uh, the, prob the probability to find the particle at a particular position was called at x, y, and z. Uh, so this equation includes the Planck's constant h bar, and uh, it includes the mass of the particle m. And generally speaking, of course, to have a non-trivial situation, it's necessary to consider the motion of the of this quantum particle in the presence of some external potential. So the external potential is de denoted here by uh, real, it's a real potential capital U. And in principle, in, in a still more general case, sometimes U may also be a function of time. If one would like to consider the motion of the classical particle in a uh, not time dependent potential, this is also possible. Okay, and now uh, <clears throat> what is uh, obvious about this equation is the fundamental fact that this is a linear equation. On the other hand, it's commonly known that if we consider uh, the classical mechanical system, which corresponds to this quantum system, so we can take exactly the same potential and we can write the classical equations of motion for the particle in the three dimensional space under the action of this potential or under the action of the forces which are, which are induced by this potential. So it's commonly known that in the general case, of course, the classical equations of motion, the Newton's equations of motion, will be nonlinear. And this uh, circumstance suggests uh, a, a, a apparently simple but important question. How, how does it happen? How come that we uh, start from the most fundamental linear equation in quantum mechanics and it's in uh, the, the classical limit, we should somehow be able to uh, restore the corresponding classical equations of motion. And somehow it must happen that while we start from the purely linear equation, at the end, in the classical limit, we should end up with the uh, <coughs> nonlinear equa uh, classical equations of motion. So how, how happens that in the process of this um, transition from the quantum uh, dynamics to classical dynamics, we will be able to uh, proceed from from the linear equation to nonlinear equations. And the answer the answer is well known, namely uh, in what is called the semi-classical limit approximation or limit. So, if we want really to consider the <clears throat> di classical dynamics, which corresponds to this quantum mechanical dynamics, it is known how it's very very well known how this should be. This transition should be uh, carried out. Namely, <clears throat> it's, in this case, uh, formally speaking, what we should do, well, it's, uh, at least as a convenient possibility to, to introduce this semi-classical limit, is to formally consider this Planck's constant h bar as a small parameter. Indeed, h bar uh, is a unit of the action, which is actually essentially the unit of the quantum dynamical variables. Uh, and then if we actually want to consider the dynamics with the val essential values of the action, which are much larger than this uh, quantum of the action, h bar, in that case, uh, we can say that essentially the small parameter will be the ratio of this quantum of the action, h bar, to the actual value of, of action that we would like to consider in this semi-classical limit. So it, all this suggests that for the mathematical treatment, we can formally consider uh, h bar just as a small parameter. And then we should try to simplify this uh, Schrodinger, linear Schrodinger equation for the special case when h bar can be treated as a small parameter. And it's uh, after some analysis, it is uh, known how this can be done. This is uh, 
where a commonly known result, which you can uh, find in full, de full detail of this derivation can be found in any textbook on quantum mechanics. And the procedure actually is represented by this substitution or sometimes such a substitution, which is going to simplify eventually the equation and the solution is called by word ansatz. So uh, the ansatz for the complex wave function is uh, we should, uh, the most important factor is introduced by means of this exponential expression. So we write an exponential of the imaginary argument. It's I, imaginary unit. Then there is a real variable capital S as assumed to be a function of X, Y, Z, and T of all coordinates and time. And then uh, the result of this very well-known result of this detailed analysis, as I said, you can find details in any textbook on quantum mechanics is to properly uh, take into regard the fact that H bar is a small parameter. We need to, to adopt the answers in which we have this uh, function S which in the first lowest approximation does not depend on H and H appears in this answers in the denominator. So it means if we look at this exponential function that essentially this is a very rapidly in this semi-classical limit, we see that actually we can say that the phase of the complex wave function, obviously this expression S divided by H is the phase of the complex wave function. So it becomes a rapidly varying um, function. Why it's rapidly varying? Because it's some sort of say, normal function S, which does in this limit does not depend on H, divided by the small parameter H. So <coughs> this entire expression is uh, a rapidly varying function. So this, if, this is actually, uh, as is very well known, a natural possibility to introduce uh, the semi-classical limit into quantum mechanics. And then, of course, <coughs> it's not enough just to postulate that we have this exponential of the rapidly varying phase. In addition, we should have some, in the census, we should have some pre-exponential factor. Here it's called F. F is a complex function also. And <coughs> the essential fact that F is somehow depends on H, but the essential assumption is that in comparison with this rapidly varying exponential function, F is a slowly varying function of all these variables X, Y, Z, and T. So and then, uh, as it's uh, known in uh, the fundamental, as, as, uh, the fundamental analysis of quantum mechanics suggests us to take this ansatz, substitute it into the linear Schrodinger equation, and thus proceed with the formal analysis, collecting terms which contain different powers of this um, of this small parameter h, starting from the uh, first of all is the lo lowest approximation we will have to collect terms which will contain actually the negative power of H. So they are large terms, large because H is a small parameter. In the lowest approximation, we will have some terms where H will naturally appear in the denominator because here we introduce it in the denominator. And first of all, we should collect these terms. So this analysis, which as I said already, can be easily uh, found in full detail in, a, in many textbooks on quantum mechanics, eventually uh, gives rise to the lowest order approximation to this equation. So this equation is equation for this uh, real function S. Yes. Uh, H uh, it does not appear explicitly because as I said, we collected the most um, uh, rapidly varying terms, uh, which can which are uh, multiplied by uh, one divided by h, roughly speaking, and then this common factor one over h is cancelled. So eventually we end up with this equation. So this uh, uh, because s was introduced as a real function, uh, this equation uh, is not complex; it's a real equation. So we started from the uh, from the linear uh, complex equation for the wave function. We substituted this ansatz. We assume that H is a small parameter. And then after some formal analysis, we will arrive at this uh, lowest order approximation. This lowest order approximation seems rather relatively simple because it's a closed equation for the single unknown function, the real function S. Actually, this function S has a very well-known meaning in classical mechanics. So if we consider the classical mechanical system, which exactly corresponds to the 
quantum mechanical system for which we started exactly corresponds means with the same potential u in the three-dimensional space. So this classical variable s is exactly what is called the classical action. And action is, um, uh, to, to, to in, briefly speaking, s is the result of the integration with respect to time of the classical Lagrangian of this mechanical system. I cannot actually, don't have enough time to, uh, to present all this commonly known elementary details of classical mechanics in full detail, but they are really very well known. And if necessary, it's very easy to find this in, in uh, numerous textbooks, both on classical and quantum mechanics. Okay, so the conclusion is, once again, we start from the linear Schrodinger equation for the complex wave function. We substitute the sunsets, and after some formal manipulations in the lowest approximation, we derive this as a zero order, uh, lowest order approximation, we derive this purely real equation for the classical action. But a, a, a remarkable fact is that also this equation seems, <coughs> excuse me, simple enough, it is nonlinear. So the nonlinearity seems very simple. We have this, uh, so nabla means a gradient, gradient is just the, by itself is a vector with the three components, the S over the X, the S over the Y, the S over the Z. And we, uh, the equation is, is, itself is of course a scalar equation because we have the scalar product, scalar square of this vector. And so this, we have just a single nonlinear term, just this quadratic term, the square of the, the square, the square of the um, uh, gradient of S. Nevertheless, also it seems that the equation is very simple and we have a very simple nonlinear term. It's obvious that due to the, this quadratic term, this is a nonlinear equation. And this is how um, um, we can naturally connect the, uh, at the fundamental level, the linear, uh, linear uh, fundamental equation in quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation, and the nonlinear uh, equations of motion in the classical mechanics. So in the classical mechanics, this particular equation, of course, is also a very important, a very well-known equation. It has a special name. It's called the Hamilton Jacobi. Some people pronounce this name Jacobi. But the correct pronunciation is Jacobi. Hamilton Jacobi equation. And as a matter of fact, uh, a very well-known uh, fact is that Hamilton Jacobi equation, as a matter of fact, is the most fundamental and most general. Uh, uh, it provides the most fundamental and most general formalism uh, for as a basis of classical mechanics. So classical mechanics, as you probably know from any course of physics, there are different levels of um, different levels of uh, equations and of description. So the most straightforward one is the system of equations of motion in the form of the Newton's equation of motion. Then uh, it's, it's known that in, um, uh, in, 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 in uh, usually the Newton's equation of motion can be derived from the Lagrangian. In other words, from the what's called the principle of the minimum action. Action is actually essentially the same as this variable. So it's uh, the uh, it's it's not it's known that if we can if we consider the uh, introduce first the arbitrary law of motion and then we demand that for the arbitrary law the arbit the correct law of motion should minimize the value of the action. Uh, after simple consider, uh, considerations, the variational procedure, uh, we should uh, calculate the variation of the action and equate it essentially to zero to provide the minimum of the action. It, 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 it will actually show us that the, the Newton's equation of motion can be derived from the Lagrangian by means of the variational principle. Then if one has the Lagrangian, there is a commonly known possibility to proceed from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian. By itself, this connection between the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian in classical mechanics is called the Legendre transformation. Again, I don't write it explicitly here because otherwise it, it will take too much time, but this is as a relation between the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian is another point that you can find in any textbook on classical mechanics. And so then the next level of description, uh, which is fre frequently used in classical mechanics, this is a system of what is called canonical equations of motion. 
these are evolution equ equations for the uh, coordinates such as x, y, z and, and the corresponding momenta. Uh, and this uh, system of equations of motion for the coordinates of momenta, these are, uh, they are derived, can be derived from the Hamiltonian and they are called the Hamilton's canonical equations of motion. Canonical means that these are, so to say, the most fundamental equations. Uh, which may be used in uh, classical mechanics. But eventually, uh, <clears throat> because if we want to work with the action, and action, as I said, is a basis for introduction of the Lagrangian, so uh, is, uh, the, as a matter of fact, the most fundamental, the highest level of description, which simultaneously seems, seems as the simplest one, will be uh, not the equation in terms of the Lagrangian and not canonical equations in terms of the Hamiltonian, but the most fundamental, the most general way to introduce the classical mechanics is to introduce this hamilton jacobi equation. And it's known that actually, if we want to try to find particular exact solutions for the various particular models of classical mechanics, of course, generally speaking, the nonlinear equations of motion in classical mechanics are not integrable. You cannot solve them exactly, but there are many important particular systems which admit non-trivial exact solutions for some uh, special law of laws of motion. And so a uh, known fact is that the most powerful method, which it makes it possible to find, so to say, the largest number of particularly exact solutions is, is provided uh, not by the Newton's equation of motion, nor by the Hamilton's uh, canonical equations of motion, but exactly by the hamilton jacobi equation. So eventually the conclusion is uh, we can establish the natural relation between the linear Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics and the corresponding nonlinear hamilton jacobi equation in classical mechanics. And this is a very, brief, a very straightforward possibility to see how it uh, happens that we start from the uh, linear theory for quantum mechanics, and in the classical limit, we end up with the nonlinear system of equations of motion in classical mechanics. Boris? Oh, yes. Uh, preview page, please. The last equation of the preview page. Yes. Uh, in that equation, what do we mean by the, by, by the square? Square, okay, so this is a very simple, very simple thing. You can, first, as I mentioned it, nabla S is a vector. So it's a, it's a standard definition of the vector. If S is a function of X, Y, and Z, you, uh, <coughs> this nabla S is a vector with coordinates ds over dx, ds over dy, ds over dz. This is a commonly known definition of the, uh, of the uh, gradient. And this is simply the scalar product of this vector with itself. And why why so, not write uh, why why not write uh, nabla square s? Na, na, uh, uh, no no this is not nabla squared s. If you write nabla squared s, you will have the notation like this. Yes. But this is this is a linear operator. It's not yeah, only, yeah, yeah. it's it's a different thing. If yes. you just write this, it means that this is a linear term, linear with respect to psi. And this operator is a scalar product of two vectorial operators, nabla. So in other words, this is a Laplacian. Laplacian is, yeah. it is commonly known as the sum of the three second derivatives. So exactly. this, this, this mathematical uh, symbol and this one are completely different because here you uh, just take the um, scalar the, square of the operator and then you apply this operator to the function on the, on the psi. Function of, yeah. Yes, and then this expression is linear with respect to psi. This is a different mathematical structure. That is non-linear. You immediately apply the, uh, the uh, gradient to the real function S, and then you, you take the square of this gradient. So it will be the, uh, as I said, it will be the scalar product nabla S times nabla S, therefore it's non-linear, it's quadratic. Yeah. So this is these are two maybe <laughs> formally speaking there is something similar in their structures but they are completely different expressions. Okay, so then what's uh, just to complete this discussion? As I said, we arrive at this hamilton jacobi equation in the lowest approximation when we formally treat H bar as a small parameter 
we substitute the sunsets and we um, collect uh, the terms in the lowest order approximation, asymptotic uh, approximation when we treat H as a small parameter. But then it's naturally to ask the question, what will be the next order approximation? Because in this, it's a natural question because this equation does not tell us anything about the pre-exponential function F, simply because uh, when we collect the terms of the lowest order, uh, we have no contribution from function F. But so, uh, somehow we should also have an additional equation which will uh, uh, make it possible in principle, to restore function f because it's a part of the full solution, even if it is an approximate solution. And so, if we proceed with the asymptotic analysis and if we can collect next order terms after the lowest, uh, after the lowest order term, we can collect collect next separately next order terms. So, we, we which are proportional to the additional power of h. The result will be also something which is very well known. We will arrive at this equation. Is, is, is this time it's equation for this pre-exponential factor f. So the scheme is we assume that maybe we are smart enough to be able to solve this hamilton Jacobi equation for s. In principle, this is equation which includes only s. So in principle, we should be able to solve this equation and find the fu function s. And for the, uh, at this stage, we don't know anything about function f. So if we were able to solve this equation, then we proceed to the next order. In the next order, we will derive this equation for function f. Now, nabla s, this is the gradient of this function, which you already know it. Nabla f is similarly the gradient of the unknown function f. This is the usual scalar product of two vectors. And with respect to f, by the way, this equation is linear. Well, it doesn't mean that it's very easy to solve it because uh, we should substitute here this yes. function nabla s and function nabla s. It, it means that we should, uh, formally speaking, we should try to solve this uh, ordinary, this um, linear partial differential equation of the first order. It includes only first derivatives, but in a trivial circumstance, is that it will be the equation with variable coefficients because if s is a function of the coordinates and time. Nabla s also will be a function, and therefore, even if this is a linear equation, it's not a trivial problem to solve it. But in principle, it provides the full description of the approximation. So, if we can, uh, if we could solve the hamilton jacobi equation and find the action s, this real function, then we can try to solve this linear um, uh, equation for uh, another real, uh, not real, but in principle, this function f may be complex. It may be complex. And then uh, this way we will, uh, if we can, if, we, if we are able to solve this equation, we will be able to predict this um, complex wave function uh, in the uh, in the asymptotic approximation, which corresponds to the semi-classical limit of quantum mechanics. Okay, now let us proceed to the first. Uh, th th so this way we discussed how the nonlinear equations of motion of classical mechanics can be uh, retrieved from the linear Schrodinger equation of, of quantum mechanics. However, uh, the, obviously the nonlinear cl classical equations of motions, of course, are ordinary differential equations. But the, the most important topic of, of the, not only of this lecture, but of the entire cycle of lectures, this will be various models which, uh, which are based on uh, partial nonlinear differential equations, not only, but partial nonlinear differential equations. And then now we will discuss how we can naturally introduce uh, partial nonlinear differ uh, differential equations as physically relevant models. And so uh, to, um, uh, we can come back to the quantum mechanical systems. And now we, we can consider uh, as, um, um, uh, as a system in which we don't have a single uh, quantum particle, but we have a gas, a gas of many, a many body system, a gas which is composed by many quantum particles. So uh, it was uh, predicted uh, almost 100 years ago, back in 1925, by the famous work of Bose and Einstein that. Uh, at, uh, <clears throat> at extremely low temperatures, in particular, theoretically speaking, just at the zero temperature, 
if we consider the many body system of bosons, bosons are particles with integer value of the spin. So the spin may be zero, one, and so on. It's so as there are many actually for uh, the physical realization, uh, um, the elementary particles such as electrons or protons and neutrons, they are not bosons because their spin is one half. So they are fermions. They have completely different statistics, but there are many atoms which are which have the integer spin and therefore they are bosons. So if we can consider the gas of such bosonic atoms and uh, what was demonstrated almost 100 years ago by Bose and Einstein uh, at the extremely low temperatures, uh, we will have the effect of what is called the Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, it means that the bosonic particles with the integer spin, they can coexist in an arbitrarily large number of particles can coexist in the same quantum state. And if we want to put uh, the system under the um, uh, um, very low temperature, so obviously because any system wants to minimize its energy, all these atoms will try to occupy the state which uh, provides the um, lowest value of the energy. So this means the condensation that all bosonic particles, all atoms will try to occupy the same state which, which uh, provides the, the, uh, the lowest possible value of the energy. This is called the Bose-Einstein condensate. And then <clears throat> um, how can we describe this uh, condensate? Uh, it's, if we, if these are ideal particles which do not interact between themselves, then indeed they can all occupy simultaneously exactly the same quantum state. And then because they sit in the same state, even if we have uh, a very large number of particles and typical experiments with uh, uh, gases of both Einstein uh, condensates, the typical number of atoms in this experiment may vary roughly speaking, between 1,000 and 1 million. So uh, it's not necessary to uh, introduce the like, um, um, uh, quantum mechanical Schrodinger equation with 1 million degrees of freedom, because all particles sit in the same state. The entire uh, gas, even if you have 1 million particles, they can be described just by the single particle wave function. So it's enough to still to consider formally speaking a single particle, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and then the, the actual number of particles will be simply represented by the norm of this wave function. Okay, so this is, it means that if we want to consider the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate and ultra cold gas of bosonic atoms, in the low, in the simplest approximation, we can just use exactly the one particle, the single particle, uh, quantum mechanical linear Schrodinger equation, the same as we discussed. However, there is one very important fact which makes uh, this condensate really different from a single particle. And this is the fact that uh, uh, when uh, real atoms, when they move, they can collide. And when they collide, somehow they interact. So in the, in the, usually in the real experiment with both Einstein condensates, this experiment is performed in the gas with a very low, uh, very low density. It may be, for example, uh, the real experiment with this ultra cold gas, the density of atoms may be lower than, for example, in air under normal conditions. It may be lower than in air by, let's say, three or four orders of magnitude. It's a very rarefied gas. But even in this rarefied gas, if the experiment uh, lasts, for example, for, for several seconds, which which is a rather typical situation, even for, uh, for less than a second, but maybe for several hundred milliseconds, this uh, typical experimental time, even in the rarefied gas, is sufficient to feel effects of collisions between atoms. Of course, collisions between atoms uh, cannot be immediately taken into regard if we consider just the single particle wave function. And uh, a very important result uh, for the a very important approximation for this situation when we have a uh, rarefied gas of bosonic particles, bosonic atoms. And uh, we want somehow, as a sum approximation, we cannot solve this problem exactly, of course, the many body problem cannot be solved exactly, but we may try to, at least to develop some approximation 
and to take into account somehow the effect of collisions between atoms in this uh, gas. Uh, it, uh, this uh, approximation was derived in 1961 uh, by two famous theorists, uh, Gross and Petayevsky. And so they derived what is called the gross petayevsky equation. So the, uh, their fundamental result is written here. So the first three terms, as you can see, is exactly the same as we already discussed in terms of the just the commonly known uh, single part, uh, the, uh, Schrodinger equation for the single particle. Now we have the, new, the additional term, the fourth term. So this term is very different from all others because it's nonlinear. As you see, it contains the square the absolute value of psi times psi. Obviously, this is the cubic nonlinearity. Okay, so psi in this approximation, psi still has the same meaning as in, the, in usual quantum mechanics. So this is essentially the single particle wave function. The, so the, the approximation which was elaborated in 1961 by Gross and Petayevsky is that if we want to consider the gas of a very large number of particles uh, with collisions between them, but this gas is rarefied, and so the, uh, somehow the collisions can be taken into regard as a relatively weak effect, it's still possible to describe this, for example, one mil gas of one million particles still by the wave function for the single particle, psi. So psi remains only a function of three coordinates, x, y, and z, and time. Uh, <clears throat> however, the um, uh, collisions, the effect of collisions in this approximation can be um, represented by the additional term added to the uh, to this Schrodinger equation. So this approximation is called the mean, usually this standard name is the mean field approximation. And the idea of derivation of the derivation of this equation is that uh, one is just um, just one one should just follow the motion of a single particle, a single particle, and then uh, in the course of the long evolution, this particle will um, undergo collisions with very many uh, with, with very many with a very large number of other particles, and approximately approximately it can be effectively taken into regard as some so all the collisions with other particles for this particular particle that we consider can be effectively considered as if all other particles, they can create the additional field similar to you, roughly speaking, as this additional field um, represents if, if effects of many collisions of a given particle with all other atoms. So this additional field, in, pr in principle, it's something which is uh, the result of the analysis is this additional effective field. This is what is called the mean field, as a matter of fact. This additional field induced by the collisions with all other particles is uh, proportional to the density of all other particles in the gas. Because in quantum mechanics, as we know, the squared absolute value of psi is actually the density or the probability to find the particle, or if we talk about many particles, simply the density of the gas. And uh, then we have this uh, coefficient AS. AS is also a result of the derivation of, of Gross and Petayevsky. AS is the fundamental characteristic of the uh, classical collision between two particles. We can consider the collisions. The collision itself in, uh, in this derivation is treated as a classical collision between two particles. And AS is a standard characteristic of the collisions between two particles, which is called the scattering lengths. As its physical meaning is quite simple. Uh, if we consider the collision between two atoms, normally these two atoms, when they collide, they bounce back. So they collide in the sum, in the simple approximation, you can consider each part, each atom as a heart, as a sphere, sphere with some particular radius, and the heart sphere. So when two spheres collide, they collide when the distance between them is exactly equal to the diameter of the sphere, or the double radius of the sphere, then they collide as two uh, mechanical, uh, classical mechanical hard spheres, and they immediately bounce back as a result of this collision. So AS, in, that, in this simple interpretation, AS will be simply the size of this uh, particle, just the size of the particle. 
<clears throat> so a h bar is again the Planck's constant, m is the same is the mass of the same particle, and this is the result of the derivation. So uh, this once again, this is not a, a fundamental equation. It's a result of some approximation of the mean field approximation, which makes it possible to consider the dynamics of the many body bosonic system in still in terms of the single uh, of the wave function for the single particle uh, taken into regard collisions or interactions with all other particles as the uh, additional nonlinear cubic term added to the single particle uh, linear Schrodinger equation. This is a very fundamental result. Actually, historically speaking, in 1961, Gross and Petayevsky, they did not derive this equation uh, for the rarefied gas of bosonic particles. Of course, they derived it from, for the bosonic system, but they actually, their original objective was to derive this equation for liquid helium, liquid helium of atoms helium-4. And this is, a, um, uh, this is a quantum fluid of uh, bosonic atoms. Uh, actually, liquid helium is not rarefied, of course. It's uh, liquid, therefore it is, as a matter of fact, con is a, a form of the condensed matter. Uh, therefore, interactions between atoms in liquid helium are not weak. And therefore, uh, in, for if, it, if uh, in the original context, this equation is not a very accurate model for liquid helium, uh, just because uh, the uh, derivation assumed a very rarefied gas of bosonic atoms. But in, in, in the original uh, physical, uh, physical subject, liquid helium, is not a rarefied gas. It's actually the medium with a relatively high density. Uh, therefore, for liquid helium, it was not a very accurate model. But much later, when the experiments with um, Bose-Einstein condensates with ultra-cold rarefied gases of bosonic atoms started, it's actually they uh, uh, started exactly 70 years after the uh, Bose-Einstein condensation was predicted. It was predicted by Bose and, and Einstein in 1925. And the first experimental realization of the state of matter was reported in 1995, 70 years later. So this experiment was, was performed really in the rarefied gas. And then it was very quickly understood that this gross petayevsky equation is an extremely accurate, absolutely appropriate model uh, to predict the dynamics of the rarefied Bose-Einstein uh, condensate. So therefore, it, this equation became an extremely popular object of studies in modern uh, physics of low temperatures and as well as atomic physics. <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, in that case, if uh, we we need still, okay, we as I said, we describe this, for example, if we have the gas of one million particles, which may be it, it's a typical situation for the real experiment. Uh, as I said, uh, the typical experiment with Bose-Einstein condensates, so the number of uh, particles is roughly speaking between 1,000, more frequently maybe, let's say, four or 5,000 and 1 million. Uh, uh, so the total number of particles will be simply represented by this three-dimensional norm of the wave function. Um, okay, <clears throat> so um, um, now we can, uh, for, uh, it, it may be quite convenient to uh, rescale this equation because it has many constants. It has a Planck's constant, it has the mass of the particle, it has the scattering length. So obviously if we prefer, if we want to develop the mathematical analysis of this equation, it may be quite convenient to rescale it, to minimize the number of free parameters and then we can proceed by means of the obvious rescaling from this equation to the equivalent equation, which is written in a simpler form. So what means what it means, this coefficient in front of the psi over dt and this coefficient in front of the number squared, we can, uh, and then the equation in front of the cubic term, each of them can be set equal to one by rescaling. Then we, u will be a rescaled potential, but the potential of course should be kept here. Uh, okay, but then what is essential is the sign in front of the cubic term. Why it's maybe, actually we may have two different equations eventually. Is this equation was plus or minus. Why is this is possible? I said that in the natural situation, when we consider 
uh, when we derive the gross Potevsky equation, A S is a scattering length, and the scattering length is roughly speaking the size of the atom. Uh, and therefore, of course, the size of the atom is something positive. And when it is positive, it means that when two atoms collide, uh, they bounce back. So the interaction between them is repulsive. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, if we uh, derive the scaled equation, which corresponds to the natural situation with positive AS, we will arrive at this simplified uh, rescaled equation with the top sign plus. Nevertheless, uh, the opposite sign minus is also possible. Uh, the point is that, of course, the size of the atom cannot be negative. However, uh, there is a very powerful um, experimental technique which is used oh. in many um, experimental works with uh, uh, ultra cold atoms and with Bose Einstein condensates. And this experimental tool, it is called the Fesbach resonance. The Fesbach resonance actually is a rather simple situation. Uh, what one should do, one should consider exactly the same physical situation, but in the presence uh, of the uniform DC magnetic field. So the result of the analysis, first it was theoretically predicted by the American theoretical physicist Fesbach, therefore it's called the Fesbach resonance. The result is that when two atoms collide in the presence of the external magnetic field, the character of the collision may become different, namely, these two colliding atoms can form a quasi-bound state. So they will not form a true bound state, but uh, they, uh, due to the uh, specific effects induced by the magnetic field, they will form a, a very short-lived quasi-bound state, which eventually will split. Uh, however, because of this effect, the uh, formation of the transient bound state the eventual result of the collision, it still will be the situation when we collide two atoms and then we again have two atoms. However, the characteristic of the collisions will, may, may become essentially different uh, if um, the collision proceeded through the formation of the short-lived bound state. And in particular, if we compare the original motion of two uh, atoms and the final motion after the collision, uh, the result will be that <clears throat> it will seem as if we had the collision between atoms not with re, uh, repulsive interacting forces, but with the attractive interaction forces. So as if when two, at as two atoms collide, so that in the process of collision, they attract each other. And in terms of uh, the gross petayevsky equation, this would mean uh, if we have, it's actually, this is a, a effect which is known just from the, uh, is a, one of the basic effects of classical mechanics. If in classical mechanics, you can you consider the interaction between two particles with the attract, attraction between them. This is quite possible too in classical mechanics, of course. It, it's known that you can still characterize the collision of two classical particles by the scattering lengths, but in the case of the attractive interactions, the uh, scattering lengths will become a negative coefficient. So this means that we may also <coughs> we, can, we may also consider the gross petayevsky equation in which the scattering lengths, this nonlinearity coefficient, will become negative. And eventually, after we apply the scaling, we will end up with this equation when the sign in front of the cubic term will be not plus but minus, the bottom sign in this equation. So in this scaled form, this is this equation is, is what is very frequently called the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And as we see, actually, uh, uh, we have not a single nonlinear Schrodinger equation. We have two different nonlinear Schrodinger equations, which correspond to different signs in front of the cubic term. As we will see, uh, actually, maybe you, you know it anyway, but we will see it later. Solutions are physically important. Uh, predictions made by these two equations are absolutely different. In particular, a very important solution which can be produced by one of these equations is a soliton. Solitons are self-trapped localized states. Uh, so solid, uh, such self-trapped uh, solitons, even they can exist even when we have no potential in the free space, just due to the effect of the nonlinearity. So uh, solitons exist only with the bottom sign minus. 
when in uh, it, it went, uh, atoms in this condensate, they attract each other. If they attract each other, it's not very surprising that eventually they can uh, spontaneously form a bound state, which will be a solid one. When they repel each other, of course, they cannot find a bound, a bound state. So we have two different uh, equations, two different nonlinear Schrodinger equations with two opposite signs here. And both equations are very important for physical applications. By the way, historically speaking, <clears throat> it's interesting to mention why this equation is called exactly the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Of course, uh, one can say because it is uh, obviously the nonlinear generalization of the commonly known linear Schrodinger equation. So maybe for this reason, it is called the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. But as a matter of fact, what should be mentioned is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is more or less in the same form. Uh, it's maybe just in the one dimensional situation when uh, we have only one coordinate text. It was introduced in the first time by Schrodinger himself. And uh, after Schrodinger actually introduced his famous linear Schrodinger equation, he was awarded with a Nobel Prize for it. And this equation became the most important basis of quantum mechanics. Schrodinger continued to work in this direction. And Schrodinger picked up an idea that maybe at the most fundamental level, the, uh, the uh, true quantum mechanical equation should contain some fundamental nonlinearity. And then uh, Schrodinger spent very many years till the end of his life trying actually to modify his famous equation, trying to make it nonlinear, to add some nonlinear term. And he tried to argue that this nonlinear modification of the Schrodinger equation would be a more fundamental model in quantum mechanics. Uh, this is actually why this, uh, this equation is called the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Actually, this attempt of Schrodinger had failed. Why it had failed? Uh, because he, when he formally introduced such a nonlinear version of quantum mechanics, it produced some predictions which were never observed experimentally. <laughs> Simply, this model, when it was when uh, Schrodinger tried to compare to consider it to replace his own linear Schrodinger equation by the non, by some nonlinear Schrodinger equation, it uh, then this nonlinear Schrodinger equation produced wrong predictions. Wrong predictions are predictions which were not confirmed by the experiment. Therefore, at this fundamental level, uh, this idea turned out to be um, incorrect. And nevertheless, many years already after the death of Schrodinger, what has happened? This nonlinear Schrodinger equation again reappeared as a very important equation for the quantum for the, the quantum states of matter for both Einstein condensate because this is a quantum state of matter is actually a many body quantum system and it's very important uh, model indeed is a nonlinear Schrodinger equation this time under the name of the Gross Petayevsky equation of course the difference uh, with the original idea of Schrodinger was that Schrodinger uh, wanted to see this equation as the most fundamental dynamical equation of quantum mechanics. And his assumption was wrong. However, this nonlinear Schrodinger equation is indeed a very, an absolutely relevant equation, but uh, not as a fundamental equation, is a approximate equation, approximate equation derived, as I said, in the mean field approximation for the many body quantum system, namely for the Bose-Einstein condensate. So somehow the idea of Schrodinger uh, was, a resurrect, was resurrected, but it was resurrected in a different form, not uh, for the single quantum particle, but as an approximate equation for the many body quantum system. Boris? Okay. Boris? Yes. Somebody has a question yes. to you. I can okay. read it. Where is the question? Uh, somebody wrote, Nathan, Nathan wrote, Boris, what is the particular difference between the nonlinear Schrodinger equation and the gross Petersi equation? That well, question, is, is, a... that question mm -hmm. is from Nathan Chepeman. Okay. The a principle, it is, uh, as a matter of fact, these are two different names for essentially the same equation. Because uh, in any case, uh, one can say that, okay, it depends on the particular form in which you write the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. If you write this as an equation, uh, as I said, for the dynamical equation, 
for the gas of bazo uh, for the bosonic gas at ultra cold temperatures, it you sim it, it you simply uh, call it the gross Petayevsky equation. It's, it's a, as a matter of fact, it remains an linear Schrodinger equation, but in the modern literature, it's usually called uh, by the gross Petayevsky equation. But as a matter of fact, it's the same equation. Now uh, we will discuss it a little bit later that. Mathematically speaking, a very similar equation, as a matter of fact, it's the same equation, and appears in a completely different physical context, this time without any connection to, to, to quantum physics in the purely classical but still very important physical situations, for example, in nonlinear optics at the purely classical level. In that case, it's um, it's almost called only as a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, because in that, in that case, it will not be relevant to call it uh, the gross petayevsky equation, the gross petayevsky model was derived as a, essentially for the quantum uh, matter. Therefore, the most generic name is a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, which in principle you can apply to any equation of this type, but uh, when you apply it to the to quantum matter, to the gas of ultra, uh, to the ultra cold gas, gas of bosonic atoms, and the tradition is to change the name to the gross petayevsky equation. Okay. Uh, yes. 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 So, uh, the soliton can can emerge from linear Schrodinger equation. Uh, I, I, I actually now I didn't hear it very well. Um, Emmanuel, can you repeat the question? Maybe I didn't hear it well. Uh, uh, soliton can soliton emerge from. Uh, uh, um, Emmanuel, did you understand the question? Because I, I, I don't hear well some words. Maybe it is, uh, it's a better for him to, to write the question. As yeah, maybe it, uh, the, yes, yes and maybe you can read it because I am not sure that I, I, understand, I understand the words. Yes, it is. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, you can write. You can write the question, and then yeah, we, we can, you can write, and Emmanuel will read it. Yes. Yes, Nathan. As Boris has said, the the difference between the two equations depends on the concept, on the mm -hmm. physical conce concept. Is, it, uh, is this a question? Okay, here is the question. Uh, can soliton yes. emerge from the Schrodinger equation? Uh, okay, mm -hmm. uh, the sol is, uh, is this is all or something else? Yes, uh, he asked whether he yes. asked whether soliton can emerge from Schrodinger equation. Okay, the answer is simple. I, I think that is, you, he, he, you want to talk about the linear Schrodinger equation. Yes, 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 of course. Okay, the linear Schrodinger equation does not have soliton solutions because the solitons are objects which may be supported only if you have the non-linearity. We are going yeah. to discuss it later, as a matter of fact. Now, in principle, um, uh, if you look at the purely linear Schrodinger equation, moreover, just in the free space, I, I mean, if you look at this equation, uh, I know that this is gross Petayevsky. I mean, when you look at this, yeah, at this place. equation in yes. the free space without you, and just in one dimension, only when you have coordinate x, this equation has local, exact localized solutions, but they are not solitons. These uh, solutions in the form, a mathematical structure is, uh, actually you can find it in any book on quantum mechanics, and they are known uh, they are not called solitons. They are called coherent states. So this is a um, localized solution. It's localized like a Gaussian, but it is not stationary. This exact solution, it actually has a width which grows in time. So this, you can, uh, uh, in the initial condition, can create this uh, coherent state as a ga localized Gaussian, and it will be an exact analytical solution of the Schrodinger equation in free space. In just in one dimension in free space, the simplest version of everything, and it will gradually spread out in time. It cannot support a fixed uh, constant width because it does not have nonlinearity. So uh, again, his, what is interesting to mention historically, in the very first paper of Schrodinger, his first publication, when he introduced 
his equation, he already wrote this exact analytical solution for his equation in the free space and with a single spatial coordinate, uh, just as an example of the exact solution. And then, uh, very, uh, then very, very quickly, but, uh, people. Uh, just... No, no, no. Share the screen. Is there a question? Someone, someone is talking, but I'm not sure I understand it. Should I continue? Yeah, I think you can continue, Boris. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, in the very first publication, uh, enable sh share audio. Audio, okay, enable share audio, okay. Very first uh, paper by um, in the very first paper by uh, Schrodinger, he already wrote this exact solution, and uh, it's very quickly its physical meaning was very quickly understood. Uh, the point is that uh, well, I do I don't have his um, particular uh, formula to illustrate it, but this is a very fundamental, commonly known fact from quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, you have the uncertainty principle. It's called the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And it means that if you try to simultaneously measure just in one dimension, the one dimensional motion of the particle, you try to simultaneously measure the coordinate of the particle and its momentum. And the uh, fundamental principle of, of, of quantum mechanics, first established by Heisenberg, is that you, you cannot measure both these characteristics, the coordinate and uh, momentum, with the, in principle, you cannot measure them uh, with the infinitely high precision. You will always have some uncertainty, quantum uncertainty in the um, measurement of the part of the coordinate and momentum. And the principle itself, the Heisenberg principle, tells you that the products of the uncertainty of the momentum, delta p, if p is the momentum, times delta x, if x is the coordinates of the product of these two to uncertainties, in any case, cannot be smaller than one half of the uh, of h bar of the Planck's constant. This is a fundamental principle of quantum mechanics. Now, uh, the question is: Okay, it cannot be made uh, smaller than uh, one half of h, but at least it may be interesting to find some special quantum states to minimize this uncertainty, so to make it exactly equal to one half of h so to minimize this uncertainty and this means as a matter of fact that if you, you if you can find a quantum state which minimizes this uncertainty it means that you will be able to construct the quantum state which is made as close as possible to its classical counterpart so such a quantum state which is the closest to its uh, quantum power uh, counterpart is called coherent state. Coherent just because the um, uh, its quantum state minimizes the uncertainty. In that sense, you can say that this is state which uh, where you maximize its coherence. And so the final result is that this exact solution in the form of the Gaussian, which Schrodinger uh, wrote in his very first paper uh, for the free motion of the particle in one dimension, this, it was very quickly demonstrated that this is exactly the coherent state. This is exactly the, the wave function of the quantum mechanical state, which minimizes the uncertainty. So this is the state of the this free quantum particle, which is closest to its classical counterpart. <clears throat> but so this is it's formally similar to a soliton in the sense that at any given moment moment of time, it's a spatially localized solution. However. It is very different from the soliton because soliton, the soliton, we will discuss it later, of course, the soliton keeps constant shape and keeps a constant width. But the, this Gaussian, the coherent state in, in quantum mechanics, keeps spreading in time, its width grows in time. Eventually, if, uh, after the long evolution, it will become extremely broad. And as a matter of fact, in the experiment, it will be lost because its amplitude will become uh, so small that it will not be possible to observe it. Okay, so let's proceed to our nonlinear things after this uh, uh, into, uh, after this discussion. Uh -huh. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, as I already mentioned, seventy years after the Bose-Einstein statistics was theoretically introduced by Bose and Einstein, this quantum state of matter, the Bose-Einstein condensate in the ultra cold gas of atoms, 
uh, actually these were atoms of rubidium. It was for the first time realized experimentally uh, in, the, in the very famous experimental work uh, um, by, um, uh, by Cornell and Wyman at the University of Boulder in the United States. So the experiment was performed with this uh, <clears throat> gas of bosonic atoms at the extremely uh, uh, low temperature, uh, is, uh, temperature uh, which uh, on the level of uh, hundreds of nanokelvin, so 10 to the minus seven of a Kelvin, roughly speaking. The necessary technique for this, it's the technique of uh, laser cooling of, um, uh, uh, of bosonic gases. This technique itself was developed by people in optics several years earlier, and then it was very successfully uh, applied here. So after uh, the gas can be cooled down to so terribly low temperatures uh, on the order of 10 to minus 7 of Kelvin, this Bose-Einstein condensation was really observed. So this is a very famous, uh, a very famous image from the original experimental paper by, uh, work by Cornell and Wyman. Uh, so this is what is uh, what, what is shown here. This is a distribution of the density of atoms, and there I guess, uh, and the, so this is essentially the function of two components of the momentum uh, or velocity, if you want, uh, vel uh, velocity in the x direction, velocity in the y direction. So this is still the thermal state, still the state was already very cold, but still it's essentially described by the cl by the classical uh, statistical uh, description of uh, the Boltzmann description, the cl not, not uh, classical, not quantum description. But the, when the temperature is made sufficiently low, the character of the distribution, so here this is a broad distribution of uh, atoms with respect to the velocities. Here, this is a transition to the state when now uh, the majority of atoms, they demonstrate this very um, sharp peak in the distribution function, which means almost all the majority of atoms now have extremely small values of their velocities. So they almost stopped moving. Of course, not completely stopped, because in quantum mechanics, you cannot have the particle which will be, which will have zero velocity. But uh, now the distribution demonstrates that they all, uh, a majority of atoms, they have extremely small values of the velocities, and this is a transition from the Boltzmann distribution to the Bose-Einstein distribution here. <clears throat> and uh, as I mentioned already, it was immediately understood that once this, um, ex this physical system became available, that it is very accurately, very accurately modeled by the nonlinear gross petayevsky equation. In other words, you can say by the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so this, um, um, this uh, experiments were performed uh, in this, I mean, the creation of the condensate was performed experimentally in several different species of bosonic atoms. The very first experiment were performed in rubidium 87, and then this was followed by uh, the creation of condensates in other species, such as rubidium 85, it's another isotope of rubidium, of rubidium, also in potassium 39 and then lithium 7. All these are bosons. And uh, what is quite important, I mentioned already that the natural sign of interactions between atoms is, is, uh, is of course, repulsive. When two atoms collide, they bounce back. <clears throat> and therefore, if we want eventually to, this is a scaled version, and we discussed it already as a matter of fact, the scaled version of the gross petayevsky equation. This time it's written just with a single coordinate x. And uh, if we have the, if, if, if we have the uh, natural situation with the repulsive uh, interactions between atoms, we will have this bot top sign. In particular, we will not be able to predict solitons. Uh, and so to have uh, more interest more interesting situation with attractive interactions between atoms. I also mentioned that one can use a very powerful experimental tool, which is called Feshbach resonance, namely applying the uh, DC uniform magnetic field is possible in some cases to effectively switch the sign of the interatomic interaction from 
uh, repulsive to attractive, or in terms of the gross no, FK equation, one can effectively uh, replace the positive scattering lengths by the negative scattering lengths, and it will mean that if eventually, for this fundamental nonlinear equation, we will have the bottom sign minus, and it will produce extremely interesting predictions such as solitudes. So, in real, in the real experiments, in the very first atomic uh, species which admitted the creation of the Bose Einstein condensate, this was rubidium 87, for some specific reasons, which we will not discuss now, uh, Facebook resonance does not work with rubidium 87. However, it was quickly found that it works uh, well enough with other atomic species. It, wo it works with rubidium 85, it works with potassium 79, and it works extremely well with this atomic species, lithium 7. In lithium 7, it's possible uh, by, by applying the magnetic, especially chosen value, strengths of the magnetic field, it's possible actually to very accurately adjust the effective uh, uh, size of the scattering length. So roughly speaking, you can very accurately control both the sign of the nonlinearity and the strength of the nonlinearity exactly in, the, in this uh, atomic species, lithium 7. So it was demonstrated that the condensate can be created in all these species as well. And it was demonstrated that uh, the Facebook resonance can be applied to them. It, it can really, in the real experiment, it can switch the sign of the interaction from repulsive to attractive. And this means eventually that if we, for example, want first of all to consider the one dimensional situation, uh, it's possible to realize both this uh, types of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation <coughs> as the gross petayevsky equation for the bose einstein condensate with both sides of the nonlinearity. And then we come to the, to the concept of soliton. Now, let us consider this one-dimensional equation. Let us, for the time being, consider it in the free space. Free space means we drop the potential. Uh, currently, we don't want to have any potential, and we choose uh, the bottom sign minus. As I said, minus means that by means of the Facebook resonance, we were able to switch the, uh, the interaction sign from repulsion to attraction. So then we will have this nonlinear Schrodinger equation of the free space in one dimension. And it is an elementary exercise to see that this equation admits a family of simple elementary exact solutions, which is written in this form. So hyperbolic cosine is this commonly known elementary function. And we have not a single solution, we have a family of solutions. So it's a very simple exercise to check that we may have a family of exact elementary solutions with two free parameters. One is eta. So eta determines, as is obvious from here, the amplitude of this solution simultaneously it determines the inverse width because uh, inverse width is uh, uh, is uh, uh, one divided by the coefficient which multiplies x. So this parameter determines simultaneously the amplitudes and widths of the soliton. And another free parameter is the velocity. Uh, this equation has the property of the Galilean invariance. This means that if you have a solution with zero velocity, you can apply the Galilean transform, and it will, it, or sometimes it's called the Galilean boost, and this boost will automatically from any uh, solution with zero velocity, this is called quiescence solution, you will immediately generate a whole family of solutions with an arbitrary value of the velocity c. It may be both negative and positive. So this way, uh, one can find, um, as, a simple, as a simple exercise, one can immediately solve this equation to find this family of exact solutions. And the structure of this solution is written here, is shown here, not written, but shown here for this solution. It's shown not in terms of the solution itself, because in uh, quantum mechanics, the observable characteristic of, the, of this quantum state is a squared absolute value, is this the probability to find the particle, or for the guess of particles is the, essentially the density. So if we take the squared absolute value, we will have this uh, localized regular uh, re uh, localized distribution with the maximum value at the center. So this is the shape of the soliton, lo the localized state, which actually supports itself. Why, it, physically speaking, why it supports itself? Due to the attraction between atoms, 
they can form this collective bound state. And then the further analysis of this solution is not as simple. So just to find the solution, <coughs> it's a very simple exercise. And what is a <coughs> more challenging exercise is to analyze the stability. So one can try to ask the question, if this exact solution is stable, which means one should add a small arbitrary perturbation, then as it's usually done for the analysis of the stability, one should linearize the, this equation <coughs> around this exact solution for the small perturbation. One should derive the linearized equation for the small perturbation. Then one should try to solve it, which is not very easy, but can be done. And eventually solving this linearized equation for the small perturbations in the context of both ancient condensates, this linearized equations for the small perturbations are usually called bogolubov degen equations. So Bogolubov and Degen were two famous scientists who as a matter of fact, for the first time, it introduced this linearized equation for the for quantum matter. And then if one is able to solve this equation, uh, this bogolubov degen equations, it's necessary to check that they will not give rise to instability, which means they will not give rise to solution, which will start to grow exponentially. So the final result is this entire family of solitons <coughs> of the uh, Linear of the no, of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation without the potential of the free space with the sign with sign minus here it is completely stable because it's stable of course it's a very important solution and then because this solution is available the, uh, a very natural idea was okay we know that in the, with a good approximation the effectively one dimensional Bose Einstein condensate can be described by this one dimensional nonlinear Schrodinger or gross petayevsky equation, right? Of course, in the uh, real experiment, some potential is necessary because if if we want to run the experiment with the gas of, bos of bosons, you should have some potential trap. If you don't apply any traps, the atoms will simply escape. Uh, but uh, in many experimentally relevant situations, the trap may be quite weak. It may be a loose potential, which in principle does not allow the atoms to escape by, by itself. It actually uh, makes it possible to create rather broad quantum states. And then uh, if this uh, condensate will be able to form spontaneously a soliton, uh, one can, uh, may run, try to run an experiment when the size of the, so the width of the soliton will be much smaller than the trapping size imposed by the potential. And this means that for the description of this experiment, one can still effectively use the equation in the free space without any potential. So this idea uh, to create, yeah, yeah, another necessary thing is to, to mention, of course, the original gross petayevsky equation is three-dimensional. How to make it effectively one-dimensional in the real experiment, one should apply a very tight trapping potential in two directions, in Y and Z. And then, so this is what is usually called the seeger shaped trapping potential. So effectively, this is like a very a, a narrow a narrow pipe. You roughly speaking, put your gas into a very narrow pipe, and then the atoms can move freely only in one direction along the axis of the pipe, while in the transverse plane, their motion is very strictly confined by the tight trapping potential. Then after some analysis, you can still demonstrate that in the lowest approximation, the three-dimensional gross petayevsky equation will be simply reduced to this one-dimensional equation, at least uh, uh, to, uh, with some accuracy. And then, as I said, uh, in the simplest case, one can still neglect the presence of the potential. Then one will predict the existence of solitons, and the question is, if they can be really observed in the experiment, the answer is yes, they were observed. So there were two famous experimental works published simultaneously in 2002. One experiment was performed by the group of Randy Hewlett at the Rice University in uh, Houston in the United States. And simultaneously, the ex a similar experiment was performed by the group of Solomon in Paris. They used exactly the same atomic species, species uh, lithium-7. Why? Because as I mentioned already, for lithium-7, um, uh, this experimental tool of Facebook resonance, it can be applied in an ex extremely accurate form. You can really, um, in, uh, you can really um, actually engineer 
you can really apply uh, the effective nonlinearity which you want to have. And um, this is a, a famous experimental um, picture, experimental image, which was um, produced by one of this experimental group, by the group of Hewlett. So in this particular uh, uh, in this particular image, what they this is a snapshot. This photo actually uh, produces a um, density distribution in the condensate in the quasi one dimensional, effectively one dimensional situation, and we, we, there are several very sharp peaks of density. So it 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 is possible to interpret each peak as an uh, in individual soliton. So this is a cluster, experimentally created cluster. You can count the cluster of seven solitons with different amplitudes, because as I mentioned, the soliton solution has a free parameter eta. So you can create solitons with different values of eta, which means with different uh, heights, different amplitudes and different widths. So here in this experiment, they observed a cluster of seven solitons with different amplitudes. Um, <clears throat> uh, and the, uh, the, so, so uh, this is a very essential experimental result. And um, <clears throat> later, solitons, uh, similar solitons were created uh, with other atomic species. In particular, several years later, as, uh, the creation of the soliton was experimentally reported in another atomic species, in rubidium 85, by another group. Uh, four years later after this experiment, here the eventual shape of the soliton was different. It seemed, although it still was essentially a quasi one dimensional soliton because in the transverse directions it was essentially confined by the tripping potential, but its, uh, uh, its snapshot, its shape was almost spherically symmetric. So, formally speaking, in this later experiment, the soliton seemed as if it is a three-dimensional object. Also, in terms of true dynamics, it was still a result of the one-dimensional self-trapping. <clears throat> uh, the difference between this experiment is that in Rubidium 85, the um, uh, experimental tool of the Facebook resonance can be applied, but uh, uh, it cannot be applied as gently as in lithium-7. It immediately switches the uh, repulsive state into the state with quite strong attraction. Therefore, the, the, this experiment was quite different, but eventually it also reported the creation of the uh, stable, soli uh, stable soliton in the Bose-Einstein condensates. In many cases, such solitons are called matter wave solitons because this um, gross petayevsky equation is the equation for the wave function and these wave functions, which are actually represent many particles simultaneously, quantum matter, they are called very frequently matter waves, or waves of quantum matter. And therefore, solitons, which can be built by this uh, wave function, they are called matter wave solitons. Okay, I assume I must stop here, because it, the time is already one hour, and a little bit more than one and a half hours. Emmanuel, yeah. I guess I can stop here, right? Yes, so yes, we will, yes, yes we will continue. Uh, with the next time, and at, uh, exactly at this position, it will be the next logical stop, a uh, logical point that we will consider. We will consider a more non-trivial dynamics. We will consider what happens when we uh, when we try to analyze the interaction of two solitons. The results also are going to be quite interesting and quite non-trivial. And for Boris? today, thank you very much for your interest. Boris? Yes. There is one more question from Professor okay. Hino. Okay. Yes. Uh, here is here is the question. Then, if we if you could uh, solve full quantum ma ma macro macroscopic uh, Raphael BEC, the soliton will not appear, while the nonlinear uh, within mean field Gropitarsky type will one D like uh, linear system is fully analytic, and will it nonlinear version give soliton solution? Okay, uh, if we want to consider the one dim dimensional situation, first of all, uh, let's, let's just focus on the one dimensional situation, uh, because here we discuss this effectively speaking one dimensional solitons. So in one dimension, the point is the, point is the following. So this solution is of course, a semi is obtained, is produced actually by the 
gross petayevsky equation. gross petayevsky equation is a semi-classical approximation. So we obtain this solution, as a matter of fact, is a semi-classical solution uh, state. So this is a state of the quantum matter, of course, but the state itself can be categorized as a semi-classical state in quantum matter. Now, the question which was asked can be interpreted, I guess, as follows. If we consider the full, the full quantum many-body theory, not the semi-classical approximation, not the mean field approximation, if we are not going to use this uh, gross petayevsky equation, but if we try to solve the full many-body quantum problems, uh, in, but uh, let us assume only in one dimension for the time being, uh, what will happen? And the answer is, the answer is, for the, uh, for the full quantum many-body problem, which exactly corresponds to this uh, gross petayevsky equation, but it corresponds uh, in terms of the many-body quantum system, uh, the exact solution is also possible. So uh, I'm not sure we will discuss it in detail because it actually this is, a re um, this is a really a very different topic, but let me mention this. If you consider the um, full many-body quantum problem for the one-dimensional uh, system, which contains many bosons, and they interact with each other, uh, they interact with attraction. Uh, but every, all, all, everything is determined fully by, the, uh, by quantum mechanics. We don't use a semi-classical approximation or mean field approximation. The final result is in this many-body quantum problem, it's also possible to find exact solutions. So this uh, technique, which gives it, makes it possible to find exact solutions, it's called better answers. So this is some particular answers, which was first discovered by the famous theoretical physicist Beta, originally German physicist, when uh, he uh, fled Nazi Germany, and then he, he worked for many, very many years in the United States. Hans Beta. So Hans Beta, he discovered the fact that you can consider this many body quant one dimensional many um, uh, system of many bosons with the attractive interactions, and he found the possibility to find exact quantum mechanical solutions for exact quantum mechanical states, and these are also self trapped solutions. So these solutions, which are produced by the uh, better answers, they can be called, and actually people call them quantum solitons. So at the, pu at the full quantum level, for many body quantum uh, problem, which corresponds exactly to the, to the Gross-Petersky equation, you also have exact solitons. And then uh, one can consider the correspondence between the simple uh, semi-classical solutions produced by the gross petayevsky equation and much more complex solutions uh, for the many-body quantum system, which are produced by the better answers, eventually it's possible to demonstrate that this semi-classical soliton is indeed a semi-classical limit of that exact quant uh, quantum soliton. Therefore, one can claim that in one dimension, both the full quantum mechanical many-body theory and its semi-classical mean field approximation, both of them generate solitons equally well, and the semi-classical soliton eventually uh, is nothing else but the semi-classical limit of the full quantum many-body soliton, which is produced by the better answers. So this is a very brief answer, as a matter of fact. If you want to get the full answer, it would by itself, it would be a subject of many lectures. Okay, I guess this is for the time being. It's enough. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But, uh, so, if someone is is wants to get to find more details, I suggest to open any book. Or is, maybe you can maybe you can just open Wikipedia and look at what is called better answers. Then you will be able to read all details about it. Another so question, can, if, Boris. Yes. If, if it is possible, another last question. I I think. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, someone wrote. How are the amplitude and the velocity and velocity of solitons related to other parameter of the group Petersky equation when trapping potential is zero? So how the amplitude is related to what? How the amplitude and the velocity of soliton uh -huh. related yes. to other parameter of the group Petersky uh, when when the potential is zero. Okay. It depends on what you call the order parameter. So 
usually in uh, mean field series, what people call the order parameter is simply the complex wave function. So if we have the uh, this, um, let us look at the, this gross Petrovsky equation. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, the concept of order parameter usually, the, simply the term order parameter is not usually used in this particular context, but mm -hmm. it's used in similar context. For example, uh, as I mentioned already very briefly today, that uh, we'll, this, this we will discuss later, we may have a formally similar equation, but when k efficient in front of this, this uh, Laplacian and the front of the nonlinear cubic term, they may be, be complex. They may have also yeah. imaginary parts. This will be what is called, instead of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, this will what is called the complex Gibbs-Bogdow uh, equation. Equations. Right, yes. And so uh, these are some physically relevant models, for example, for semiconductor, for the, for, uh, for the super, not semiconductor, superconductors. And in that case, usually, uh, this wave function psi, it is what is called the uh, order parameter. And so then if sometimes you may have solid like solutions also for these dissipative models, we will, I guess we will have a chance to discuss it. There is, there is a concept of dissipative solitons. So if you have, a, uh, for example, a dissipative soliton as a solution of the gisbert landau equation, then it is, uh, it's in many cases, this wave function itself is called an order parameter. And then if we have uh, sometimes the structure of the soliton uh, will be rather similar to this. Uh, we will discuss it later, I think. Then the amplitude will simply give the squared amplitude will simply give, give you the maximum value of the um, order parameter, as a matter of fact. And the velocity, if it, if you may have the moving soliton, it simply will be the velocity at which this collective excitation of the order parameter is able to move in the system. Okay, I guess for the time being it's enough. Otherwise, we will have to discuss it for a very okay. long time. Okay, next, next time, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Boris. Yeah, thank, thanks to everyone for the interest. And so, uh, ne so next Tuesday, I will not be giving the lecture, but then um, um, uh, the Tuesday after the next Tuesday, I will. I guess I will be talking it, for three hours. Yeah, three hours of lecture on the okay. September 26th. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you and see you sometime later. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And see you next time. Yes. Okay. Okay.